All right. Um, can you see oh, my like, screen? It's weird. Your fonts aren't coming through. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm sure. Uh, so I, I work at CSNTM. Um, I've been there for about a year. Uh, before that, I was at Tyndall House, um, and I'm still. I was working with Dirk Yonkin on the textual commentary for the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, which is still in the works. Um, it'll be out sometime. Um, but yes, we're talking about P50 today, and uh, I have 40 minutes. You said. Yeah. So um, the question that I've got is, uh, is P50 real or is it fake? Um, I've wrestled with this a lot. I've, I've changed my mind a lot. I've gone back and forth on it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you the reasons why I think it might be fake um, and then engage in some uh, reason speculation to spice things up because it's more fun to have uh, an accused party for uh, a fake. So uh, P Yale one three is uh, that's P fifty. Uh, it is at Yale. Um, have to do it that way. There it is. Uh, this is the manuscript. That's the whole manuscript. Um, that's all it is. Is the single bifolio. There's. Uh, I'll refer to these as columns. It's column one, column two, column three, and column four. Um, it was purchased by Michael Ivanovich Rostovtsev from Maurice Nachman in Paris, June of 1933. And that's about all we know about it. Um, uh, it was purchased together with a number of other texts of Egyptian provenance. It's at Yale, as I said. It contains Acts 8, 26 30 through 32 and Acts 10, 26 through 31 in an unusual non-continuous format. Uh, these two folios are not a sheet from a larger gathering with the text uh, missing from the inner sheets. This is the whole thing. This is the manuscript as it existed. Uh, Acts 8, 26 through 32 goes through here and it stops. And then on the next line, this is Acts 1026. So it's very unusual format. It was first edited by Carl Kraling in a 1937 festschrift for Kearsop Lake. And it was re-edited in 1967 uh, by John Oates, Alan Samuel, and Bradford Wells. And I'll refer to that 1967 edition quite a bit. Um, Stephen Immel conserved it at some point between 1983 and 1996. Um, and it's been assigned varying dates within the range of the third century to the fourth or the fifth. Uh, are you working on something? No, I'm just plugging the computer in. Sorry, keep going. All right, sorry. Um, now, there are other fakes in Yale's collection. Um, here are some that uh, are known to be fakes. Uh, I, I will say that P50 is nothing like these. Uh, if P50 is a fake, it is on a, just a different level of, of uh, ability. It's unlike any other fake, if it is fake. Um, it's exceptionally good. Some of these are just obviously fakes. They're, they're terribly made. Um, this is, uh, a, according to a database checked about a year ago of known fakes in the Yale, Yale's collection. Uh, the uh, papyrus exhibits a number of anomalies in itself, and so collectively those anomalies, I think, might question its authenticity. They're the fiber direction, text avoiding lacunae, um, uh, issues with ink letter forms, a discrepancy between the copyist's apparent knowledge and skill. And so I would suggest that we do a bit more testing on it um, to ask mm. if it could be authentic or not. But um, I'm going to take the license, like I mentioned, to be a little inconsistent and suggest a forger if it happens to be fake. Like I said, it, it, it could be real. And I, I don't want to, I don't think I can overemphasize that the hand does like when you stick back on a macro level, it does look really, really like an authentic ancient documentary hand. Like on a, on a macro level, without looking at the details, it's a really good representation of, a, of an authentic documentary hand for this period. It's when I go into those details where things start breaking down. 
Uh, now, the first anomaly is admittedly complex, but that's uh, the fiber directions. And it appears that the papyrus fibers are at odds with the extant text, particularly on column two, right here where I've got uh, the image. Now, based on the text that should be in the papyrus, it, it appears that Stephen Immel put these uh, fragments too close together, and he didn't leave enough room for the text that would have appeared in the manuscript. And you can see my crude drawing in of the ink. This is the word alto. There's just not room for an upsilon and a tau there. Uh, now, however, in this conservation, a lot of times in papyrus conservation, you align the papyrus by fibers. And the fibers line up. The fibers are accurate here. Uh, it's the text that's problematic. So if, if we presume forgery, one explanation for this phenomenon is if the papyrus was, was too far apart when it was transcribed. And so a forager, if the holes are already there and the forager is trying to write around the holes as if the holes happened later, uh, these things would have been too far apart, um, more like this. So when we rotate it out like that and assume that the forger wrote on it when it looked something like this, the text lines up pretty straight. There's room for the letters. And this is a, you know, a chi, so you do have a slight space before chi is very often. Um, but the papyrus fibers don't. They come in at an angle and they come out straight. Uh, the, another issue is text avoiding lacunae. Uh, there are a few places where it looks like the papyrus has already been damaged when it was inscribed. And the question we got to have is, is that more likely to happen with an ancient scribe or a modern one who is using ancient papyrus uh, that could already been damaged? Now, at this point, this is on column three, there is something like a square piece missing. Uh, so we have chi right here. And uh, I forget, uh, it's not the letter it looks like. I think it's air chi or something. Um, but the, uh, there's no missing text. The text continues on the next line with no missing letters, but here above and below, the text extends out. So this piece was missing definitely when the papyrus was written. Uh, another, another place is you have this missing strip of papyrus, but you've also got this crack where it's been folded. Uh, this is around the same spot uh, on column three. And what you can see is as you follow this crack through, the first few letters kind of go there. Now, this epsilon does seem to not curl around all the way. It stops right at the edge of the hole. And then this new all of a sudden swings up and all of the letters avoid this crack. It crack is going to be hard to write over. And so it, it could pose problems for a, a copyist. Um, now, the question again is, was this crack if this crack was already there when the virus was written, is that more likely to be an ancient scribe or a modern one? Uh, another uh, example of text avoiding lacunae is the spacing. Here is a spot where there's a big hole, and you can see that the spacing between these two lines is about twice as much as the spacing between these two lines. If you're writing and you kind of want to go under the hole, that's a subtle way of, of doing it. Again, is this uh, is it more likely that an ancient scribe spaced the lines that way before the hole was there? That is certainly possible. Uh, or could this be a modern hand? Here's another another one uh, where the spacing adjusts. I'll say that I'm not as convinced by this one, although I was greatly convinced by it at first. Uh, got some feedback from somebody who does not think it's fake. And he showed me a few other areas on the papyrus where uh, this happens at the beginning of words, uh, where the scribe's writing out and the text dips. It does happen at a very um, convenient place, though, because there's a hole right here. And you can see how the spacing does change. It's not just a, a, a trick that you're seeing from the hole, but the spacing is different. Uh, here, again, when we look at individual letters, not all of these could be evidence of forgery. I think this one is just bad papyrus. You see things like that. But here is a misshapen epsilon. Why would the epsilon be cut off so uh, narrow at the top if the papyrus were there or already original. And you have letters that just come right to the edges of holes pretty consistently. This alpha is squished. The alphas don't usually get that squished, but this one is. Here's another epsilon coming right to the hole and the lambda on the other side coming right up to the hole. It's as if somebody was trying to avoid holes. My favorite one is this one. That's a new, not an eta. 
um, news don't look like that, right? You can see how it's almost coming straight across, whereas news comes straight down pretty consistently. And it just happens to fit right, right in where there's papyrus. Um, is it more likely that uh, an ancient scribe wrote a new in that shape and then the papyrus over time uh, became uh, lacunos just in those areas or could that be a modern a modern copyist. Here's another one where the if the text goes right up to a crack, it just skips this hole. Another new that fits just perfectly in between two holes, a row that goes right up to the edge. Uh, I mean, is this uh, stuff more consistent with an ancient or modern one? Here, this one's probably bad papyrus, but I mean, you can see the the rounded edge of this epsilon at the bottom. Um, that's not going all the way through. The ink stops right there. Uh, so is it more likely that this happened um, in a genuinely ancient papyrus or is this a uh, modern forger? This is another example, and the reason I, I point this one out is because we have other examples of it, uh, is that the spacing, the lines up here on top are more compact, but they're more spaced out at the bottom. And the reason for this is, if you're going to write through a papyrus that's already got holes in it, one way that you can subtly reduce your trouble is to space out your lines just slightly, and so you have fewer lines to write through those holes. Um, and this is what happens. Is it more likely that an original scribe who didn't have these holes spaced uh, them out this way, or um, could this be a modern production? This is a, a manuscript that we know to be a fake, and you can see that it's doing the same thing. Where the manuscript has more holes up top, the lines are more spaced out. Uh, where there are fewer holes, the lines are more uh, packed together. Uh, we can make a few observations on the ink. Uh, one is that there are ink and particles on the papyrus surface. This uh, has been seen in other fakes. There's a manuscript in the Skoyan collection, one of the fake Dead Sea Scrolls uh, in the Skoyan collection that um, has what looks like table salt um, under the ink. And it's this uh, particulate damage. There's some kind of, uh, not damage, contamination. There's some kind of par particle contamination here. And sometimes it's on top of the ink, but right here we have the ink going over it. Um, we have the ink just going over it here as well. And it's as if these letters were almost written around the contamination, uh, but not quite. It just touches here. There's another part where it, it covers over uh, some. Uh, we also have the issue of ink bleeding. Uh, ink bleeding can happen if you're not particularly skilled at making a manuscript and you don't get the consistency of the ink right. Um, what is a little weird to me is uh, this almost looks like it's been scraped off to minimize uh, how bad it looks. So it's, you know, it, you can see it, it definitely ink bled, but it's not as dark as what's around it in most cases, it, it looks touched up. And you can also kind of see these deep cracks with ink going into the deep cracks. Um, if the cracks were already there, this is terrible papyrus. Um, but if you were to create a fake manuscript using ancient papyrus, that's exactly what it would look like. Um, generally speaking, those deep cracks like that wouldn't be there in uh, a new papyrus. And here you can see where ink has bled and it's not been scraped. It really is dark. Um, so that, that really makes me wonder about uh, some of these other places where the ink is. Looks like it's been scraped off. Um, patching or retouching uh, is another uh, thing that's common in forgeries. This is one that Stephen Carlson has written about. He is the one who uh, proved that a uh, manuscript called Archaic Mark was a forgery because he identified the, the printed edition it was copied from. He's also written on the secret gospel of Mark, which many people think is a forgery. He uh, thinks that patching or retouching is um, also evidence. It could just be evidence of someone who's not a well-practiced scribe uh, because the, the idea is you know what the letter is supposed to look like, but when you write it out, you don't quite get it, and so you've got to go back and fix it. Um, if 
P50 is a school exercise. This could be the teacher coming in and kind of showing the student what the letters are more supposed to look like. That is a possibility. Um, so there is that. But we also have some anomalies with the hand. Uh, my favorite one is this first one, Altu. This is the word Altu, but look at the upsilon. Normally you have an upsilon that looks like this. It's almost like a gamma, a, a single loop. It's really common in this sort of hand. This looks like a modern upsilon. Um, I've looked and looked, and I don't think I have found a single other example of an upsilon that looks like this in ancient papyrus. Now, there is one that's that's the bowl, and it's got a tail on it, and we do see that form elsewhere in this manuscript. So uh, maybe the scribe just forgot to put the tail on the upsilon. It really looks like a modern upsilon, though. And it comes at the end of the line. And at the end of the line, you're not concentrating as much. You're thinking about starting at the next line. So it's a really common place for scribal error to happen at the end of a line. Is this a place where a modern scribe's modern handwriting slipped in? It's possible. Another one are these two. These look like modern punctuation, a semicolon. Uh, marking a question. Now, what's interesting here is in Tischendorf's edition, I just checked Tischendorf because it would have existed when P50 would have to have been forged if it's a forgery. At both of these places, there's a semicolon in the printed text. Um, I want to say the semicolon for a question doesn't show up until a few centuries later than this manuscript is dated. Um, there, there is punctuation that happens earlier um and and the punctuation is one of the issues with dating because the 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 era that the handwriting seems to match is not an era where we would expect a lot of punctuation nor is the handwriting um so it it seems a little suspicious to have things that look like semicolons at places where printed editions have semicolons another uh fee all in one go it's a bit unusual but you do see it occasionally in ancient papyrus this is a great one too. This is half an, of an omega, uh, but it's the second half. And I, for the life of me, I can't see any evidence of there being a first half here. This shape just doesn't match that. It's almost like the scribe started to write an omega and then realized that's gotta be the second half and just stopped, but didn't fix it. It just looks suspicious to me, right? There's also a discrepancy between the copyist's apparent knowledge and skill. You can see the skill is pretty terrible. It's not a very good hand and not a very clean hand, um, but the text is surprisingly good. Uh, it's a pretty valuable text. There's 14 corrections, and you saw how big the manuscript is. It's, it's like there's not room for that many corrections. Um, the corrections all seem to be by the copyist himself or herself. Uh, which tells us that the copyist was someone who was very familiar with what a literary manuscript should look like and should read like and was, uh, thought the text was important, but wasn't really competent to execute that. Uh, there are a few uh, unique readings as identified by one of the editions. Most of these, however, are pretty simple. Ha, de, and kai ha is, uh, it takes like two days of text criticism to figure out that that's a change that could very easily happen, you know. Um, Proselthone and prosdramone could be used synonymous, synonymously, and it, it wouldn't really take uh, someone who is all that clever to substitute proselthone for prosdramone. Um, Apento unico um, is just supplying the, the uh, dative, the indirect object. It's making the text more explicit, which is really common. Uh, ara and ara ge, again, uh, just adding or dropping a, a ge, dropping a syllable is really common. The one that's a little unusual, it seems, is this one. And I do have a possible explanation if it's a forgery. Uh, this is an addition uh, uh, by ropes of acts. And right here, there is a textual variant at that uh, de. If I can go back. At, uh, at this ain te, it's te de. Um, if the person were looking at this particular edition and skipped a line, right here is uh, hutos, hutos. It's a stretch, um, but it could explain that. 
Now, uh, the thing though is that the nomina sacra in this manuscript are consistently correct with standard forms. Um, punctuation and diacritical marks are used correctly, like grammatically, it's right. Um, the scribe's orthography, though not above reproach, this is a quote from the original editor, is at times better than that of the great fourth century codices. So you've got this manuscript with a handwriting that looks this terrible, and the spelling is at times better than Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. That is a little strange. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as far as the text, it um, generally agrees with Vaticanus and Codex Bizet. Um, and when they differ, usually with Vaticanus, but occasionally with Bizet. That textual affiliation becomes later when I throw in an accusation. Um, so, uh, the copyist clearly knew what a literary manuscript should look like, including even nomina sacra and punctuation. He or she also clearly cared for the text, making numerous corrections so that the text would be accurately copied. Unusually then, the first pericope ends abruptly in the middle of a sentence and does not complete the, the citation of Isaiah 53.7. It reads, as a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the one shearing it was silent, dot, 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 and that's it. It moves to Acts 10, and, and even that's a correction. The copyist did not add uh, the conclusion. He Thus, he did not open his mouth, but um, even the ending silent, aphonos, was added after the copyist had originally intended to end the pericope after keirantas aton. I'll go back to the beginning and show you. Um, well, actually, you can see it in this one. This is it. You can see the line originally before Aphonos, and then Aphonos left, left blank and the Acts 10 starts. Uh, so for someone who cared so much about the text, knew uh, what the text uh, should look like, it's a little strange to see that sort of uh, skill or lack thereof and uh, extending even to getting things like that wrong. Uh, despite the copyist's accurate knowledge of the proper text and features of a Christian literary manuscript, the copyist was apparently not at all accustomed to producing one. Um, the uh, 1967 edition says the most obvious suggestion, especially in view of the many corrections, is that this was a school exercise, but the hand is not that of a schoolboy, and the corrections were made by the original writer. The editors conclude it is mysterious. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> in light of the observation that the hand is not the hand of a trained copyist, but is the hand of someone who's well acquainted with manuscript conventions, could a better man explanation be that it's fake? If it were produced by someone who knew manuscripts well, that could explain why the nomina sacra and punctuation are completely regular. The text does not contain any particularly interesting readings and why the copyist was a zealous corrector who aimed to get the text correct. But it could also explain why the handwriting is not that of a skilled copyist and why so many corrections were needed. A skilled textual scholar, well acquainted with manuscripts, might be able to replicate the right kind of handwriting, but not without difficulty. Uh, the text of P50, however, in light of its difficulties, is precisely what we might expect from such a forger. So as a little interlude here, I'll say uh, it, it might be a modern fake, and I've tried to argue that from anomalies in the papyrus itself. Um, I want to say again, if you step back on a macro level, the hand really does look like a documentary hand from that era. It, it really does. Uh, so if it's a fake, it is an exceptionally good fake, especially for something done in the 1930s. Um, it would take an absolute brilliant person, an absolutely brilliant person to have to have pulled this off. Uh, so to make to spice things up a little bit, I've, I'm going to suggest just such a brilliant person who uh, may have done it. At any rate, it's easier to, to get knowledge going by disproving an existing theory than by coming up with a new one from scratch. So if somebody wants to disprove me, I'm gonna set them up to be able to do that. Now, if P50 is not an authentic Greek New Testament manuscript, 
Just checking to make sure I'm not giving away my secrets with the next slide. If it's not an authentic Greek New Testament manuscript, it would not be the first one to be included in the Kritzka Fastalista. Gregory Elan 2427, which is archaic Mark I referred to earlier, is an infamous example of a modern production that was once thought to be ancient or at least uh, older. However, before Mary uh, Virginia Orna discovered Prussian blue in it, which was first made in 1704, or Stephen Carlson identified its exemplar as Philip Butman's 1860 edition of the Greek New Testament, there were doubts about archaic Mark's authenticity. Kirsop and Silva Lake never completely committed to a position on its authenticity, though. Uh, Margaret Mitchell and uh, her co-authors report that according to a letter from Chuck Benison to E.C. Colwell, Silva Lake was asked again about Marca archaic Mark in June of 1970. Uh, her husband, Kirsoff, was a lot older than she was. He died in 1946. So in 1970, um, some students came to her again and asked her about archaic Mark. She still would not commit to a position regarding its authenticity, but she remarked, <clears throat> It's either 14th century or a 19th century forgery, and if a forgery, either a serious attempt or a spoof by someone like my husband. <laughs> now, perhaps Silva Lake's comment reveals more than she intended at the time. Kearsop Lake was a New Testament textual critic and Harvard professor who certainly had the means and opportunity to produce P50, and according to his wife, he may have had the motive as well. By 1970, she did not seem to think it had been beneath her late husband to have made a fake manuscript as a spoof. Uh, Silva Lake and Kirsop's daughter Agnes were two of the three editors of Lake's Fest Shrift in which the Adidio print caps of P50 was published. <clears throat> if it was a fake, they, especially Silva, would have almost certainly known the truth. And so from this, I'm going to have the working hypothesis that P50 is a fake and that Kirsop Lake uh, is its scribe, and he created it as a spoof or a joke. There does seem to be an intent to deceive, but not in a malicious manner. If Lake is its creator, then I suggest he intended it to be published, accepted, and forgotten before its authenticity was questioned, and as it turns out, that is exactly what has happened. A few aspects of the papyrus may point to Kirsop Lake as its scribe. Um, First, I mentioned it was published in his Festschrift. Now, publishing a fake manuscript in a book written in someone's honor might not be a great way to honor them unless the person made it as a fake and you publish it as, to be serious. That's a pretty good way to honor the person. Uh, second, uh, this is a manuscript of Acts that came onto the scene as the final volumes of Lake's five volume work on Acts with uh, F.J. Folks Jackson were being published. Uh, it's a big series. It's about that wide on the shelf. It's called Beginnings of Christianity. Uh, Lake and folks Jackson were the two editors. Uh, this is a major work on Acts, and the last volumes were being published around the time P50 shows up. By this time in his life, Lake had invested heavily in the Acts of the Apostles. So the text is very fitting for him. As I mentioned above, uh, Lake wrote in the preface to the translation and commentary volume in that five volume work that he thought the original text of Acts was more like Vaticanus than Codex Bizet, but occasionally Codex Bizet preserved original readings against Codex Vaticanus. And if you remember that general position on the original text of Acts describes precisely the textual affiliation of B50. Now, finally, there's one textual anomaly that might point to Lake, but it's subtle and highly speculative. I mean, I admit that. The hand is uneven, but there seems to be too much text re uh, required to fit on the first line. This is the first line of it. Uh, we can tell from the whole, the rest of the manuscript that this was the first line of the work. There, there is no more to it. There wasn't a page before this, so this is the first line. Um, but the ECM prints, uh, Angelas de Curiu Elalesen Pros Philippon. So Angelas de Curiu. I've got Pneuma de Curiu here. And uh, the reason is there's just not room right here for Angelas. By the way, these letters were taken from elsewhere in the manuscript, mainly from this page, because this page seems to be the most consistent 
handwriting fatigue set in and the, the letters get really sloppy towards the end, but that's also what we see in a lot of letters uh, from back then. Now the text at the end of this column survives, you can see bits of it there, but not the beginning. Uh, Kraling considered the possibility that there were that many letters on the line, but he said the word angel must have been abbreviated given constraints of space. There's simply not enough room for the word angelos here. But we know the word angelos had to go there because we know that's where the text started. Um, there's another explanation for an abnormal line length. Uh, volume four of the five volume work is a commentary on Acts by Lake and Henry Cadbury. And uh, Lake acted as the final editor of the whole is how the, the book describes itself. At Acts 826, which is this verse, uh, Lake and Cadbury note the mentions of the spirit and a spirit of the Lord in verses 29 and 39, adding, it is doubtful how far the writer of Acts distinguished between angel and spirit. Lake had already made a similar statement as early as 1915. Uh, he referred in an article to the apparent exchange of usage between spirit and angel of the Lord in the story of Philip. So in 1915, in this text, uh, Kirsop Lake was saying that angel, uh, angelos, and pneuma were interchangeable theologically. So if we put pneuma as a nomen sacrum here, the line link fits perfectly. Uh, for someone, as I mentioned elsewhere, the nomina sacra are perfectly executed. Angelos is not a normal nomen sacrum. It would be incredibly strange for someone who got everything else right to have such an unusual nomen sacrum for the first word, but punuma fits, and it fits really well. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there seems to be a discrepancy between the knowledge of the copyist of P50 and his or her skill. It was clearly written by someone who knew normal manuscript conventions well, but was not a well-practiced copyist. Kirsop Lake, as its copyist, would explain that discrepancy. He was certainly familiar not only with manuscripts, but also with various readings and what to expect regarding scribal error. Um, there's uh, another, another example of a, a textual variant that I, I skipped. I didn't mention it earlier and I meant to, I apologize. There's one place where the editors describe this and there's, it's a correction and it's a correction where there happens to be a difference between uh, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Bize. What's unusual about it though, is that it looks like um, it's in column three, line 17. It looks like the writer planned to write um, amen, tain, enatain with most of the manuscripts. So this is what Codex Bize has. And instead, it's corrected to nestuon, which is the Codex Bize reading. Um, and uh, the editors in 1967 wrote, it's possible to suspect that he was familiar with the other text and failed for a moment to note the divergence of his archetype. So like it's as if the scribe knew of a specific textual variant and forgot that his text had one and had to correct it to the one he wanted to put there. Lake is, is absolutely someone who would have known that. And in 1926, those two readings were available on facing pages in uh, Rope's edition. Uh, so we get back to Lake. Um, he certainly had the skill or had the knowledge to pull this off. Uh, now, if it is fake, it is a brilliant fake. It, it really is a brilliant fake. On uh, stepping back again, this hand really does look like a documentary hand. Uh, one useful thought experiment is to step back and think about what kind of fake uh, you would want to create if you wanted to create a spoof in the 20s or 30s that they had the potential to go undetected. And what you might do, ideally, uh, you would want something pretty small because the bigger the manuscript, the more chances you have to mess up and be exposed. P50 is pretty small. There's not a lot of text there. Uh, you should have something uh, format-wise that's unusual enough that it can't easily be compared with anything else, but at the same time, not so unusual that it would draw too much attention to itself. Again, P50 fits the bill, two excerpts from Nats on a single bifolio. 
The text can't be too unusual, but it also can't be too clean. It should contain enough variants and copyist errors to make it look like a real manuscript. That's one of the things that gave away Secret Mark. Uh, Secret Mark had no mistakes whatsoever, not even spelling <laughs> issues, which is completely uh, suspicious. At the same time, the text shouldn't be too interesting uh, so as to drag, uh, draw unwanted attention. It, it's not mentioning anything like Jesus having a wife, right? Um, the date of the manuscript should not be so early that it attracts additional research. Nobody's claiming that this is from the first century. Um, so in short, if one wanted to create a fake manuscript that had a good chance of not being exposed, P50 is exactly the sort of manuscript you would make. It's the sort of papyrus that might be cited for only a few variants, but it's not in itself enough to change anyone's opinion on the text at those places. It's the sort of manuscript that could sneak into a critical apparatus and be forgotten. It would take an exceptional mind to conceive of the perfect fake, but Kearsop Lake may have been just that exceptional person. He lived at the right time and he fits the bill for the person required for the task and his wife did not think, seem to think that such an endeavor was beneath him. He had the means. As for motive, he had the motive, it seems. According to his wife, it wasn't beneath him to make a fake manuscript as a spoof. Uh, with regard to opportunity, uh, a terminus antiquim can be set at June 1933 when the papyrus was purchased in Paris. So it had to have been made before that. Uh, now, Lake's time spent in and around Egypt is well documented. In, in addition to his work at St. Catherine's Monastery, Lake uh, places himself in Cairo, both in 1927 and again in early February 1930. I've not yet been able to place Lake with Maurice Nachman, but I have been able to place him with uh, one of Nachman's associates, David Askren. I found a letter that explicitly mentioned that they were to meet. Um, so in conclusion, uh, this papyrus has anomalies. Um, perhaps it has enough anomalies to justify a closer multidisciplinary look. Uh, microscopic analysis, especially of the areas around the holes in the virus, might be able to shed additional light on whether the damage where text is missing occurred before or after the papyrus was uh, written on. Um, and I've, I've been trying to see it. Yale is closed to outsiders and has been for a, a while. Uh, I've not been able to get in. If radiocarbon dating is an option, a discrepancy between the paleographic date and uh, the radiocarbon date could uh, raise questions. That's what happened with the Jesus Wife papyrus. They dated it early and found out the papyrus was a few centuries later. Um, so there could be, if it's fake, there could be more work to be done. Um, again, it could be genuine. The man that the hand really does look like a documentary hand, but the manuscript has several anomalies. It may be a genuine but genuinely bad papyrus manuscript of the Greek New Testament, but in light of its anomalies, might it be a Kirsop fake? <laughs> At least you have better fonts on the last slide. I'm sorry? At least you have better fonts on the last slide. Yeah, I only did it at the beginning to mess with you. <laughs> Can we? Is that the end? That's the end. Oh, that's the end. OK. Yeah. Um, is that? Never mind. I'm not going to ask. Um, questions? I have questions. But, um, Can we? Questions? talk through the, the motive again. He just wanted to make us. I think so. I mean, the, the more I read about Lake, he just think he, I just think it was a joke to him. Um, he just, for whatever reason, he just thought it was kind of funny. I think so. Uh, he, it's, he seems to be, I to have gotten pretty disillusioned with Christianity. Um, but he was a, he was a professor <laughs> of Christianity. Um, and I'm sure that, had a lot of issues in those days, especially. Uh, and so I just, I get the impression that he kind of thought it was a joke if, if it was him. Um, I was really interested that in the collection, especially at Yale, they have um, many um, 
documents that they know are forgeries. Um, I guess what would lead them to keep those in the collection? And then are there actually, or is there any value to forgeries? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say, yes, they're, they're absolutely valuable. I mean, if this one's a forgery, and especially if it's made by Lake, to me, it makes it so much more interesting than it is um, as a, as a P50. P50 is like, it's just another little fragment and there's not enough there to really get a good handle on it. It's not enough to change the text anywhere. Um, but if you've got someone creating it, um, that brings a whole, a whole new set of questions. I mean, for one, you, they paid money for them. There may be some legal reason why they can't get rid of them, right? Um, and they're not, they're not that many. I mean, there, there are fakes in a lot of papyrus collections. There's a database of them, um, but there's a lot more real manuscripts. So it's kind of like somebody slips one in, um, maybe to get a few more dollars. I don't know. Why they're useful though. I mean, you, I, I used at least one in, in the written form. I have a second manuscript, images of a second one, uh, where one of the ways we can identify fakes is by looking at other fakes to see what sort of mistakes get made. Um, and the more examples we have of that, the, the better. Uh, so they can they can tell you things like that. And, and I mean, and there's another category of fake as well, uh, in which um, there were, uh, I think about a hundred years ago, there was a small group of uh, scholars, scholars, con artists, I'm not sure, but they they got their hands on some genuine Greek New Testament manuscripts and they drew icons in them and then sold them for more money because illuminated manuscripts are worth more. Um, and uh, they got caught, or one reason was because the, the pattern of wear. So the more layers of paint you have, the thicker it is there and the more it's gonna rub against uh, the, the facing pages. And so over time, what tends to happen is faces, because they're so detailed, start to rub off um, and they may rub off first. And this, it was one guy and his team, he was very proud of his work because he was a genuinely good artist. I mean, he was good at what he did. And so he even rubbed off bits to age him, but he left the faces because that's the hardest part. And he was kind of proud of it. And so it looked suspicious. It's like, why is the, the wear pattern opposite of what we would see in a real manuscript? And then it, what, I mean, what really gave it away is he, he got one and, and, um, drew an icon on a page that had been photographed and published uh, before he drew on it. And so that was, um, it's over at that point. But I mean, having, so you wouldn't want to get rid of those because there is still genuinely good, real stuff in it. It's the fake has been added to it, not, um, you know, there's still real there. Uh, so that's another reason why you, you wouldn't want to get rid of stuff. What I guess I'm trying to figure out, at least for me, I would want to know if it was a fake or not. Why would Yale prevent further study on? Oh, right now it's uh, coronavirus restrictions. Oh, um, yeah. Coronavirus. So they're not, they're not like keeping me from it at all, other than just they have a blanket policy. You have to be a Yale student or faculty uh, to to be able to use their library. Um, I've I've written to them a couple of times. I've even written to the guy in charge of this manuscript and he's done stuff with fakes. And like, there's a video of like, he loves fakes because they can be really interesting and they can tell you about who, who made them. Uh, he seemed to be the kind of person who would be very much for this. And he said, I can't, it's a, it's a school, it's an institution-wide policy. And I've, I don't have the authority to grant exceptions to that. All right, so I got some questions. First of all, in your font choice, why? But um, second of all, uh, so a couple of things strike me on the, the break. Um, it breaks it off phonos, right? Right. Verse 32, which is is the middle of the sentence, but at least is the end of a clause, right? Right. Um, what's, the, what's the normal explanation for why we jump from Acts 8 to Acts 10? Is it that it's a writing exercise? 
Uh, it could be, it could be that. I think one scholar wrote that it was possibly something like sermon notes or like a, a reminder to preach from these passages. So you don't have to have the whole passage, but just enough to kind of get you going. And then is there any good explanation for that if it is a forgery? I'm thinking a forger would seem more likely to just copy straight text rather than do something that looks weird. Well, if you copy straight text, then it's a continuous text manuscript, and we have a lot of those. Right. Which is, for me, a reason why I think maybe not continuous text, because if it's if it's you know just normal, then you can compare it to other normal manuscripts. But if it's a little unusual like this, I don't. Maybe there was some reason for picking these passages. Yeah. Um, I I didn't want to get into that too much. I would rather know who did it rather than speculate and then try to kind of line up stuff. Sure. Um, so it was yeah. And then there, there are a lot of uh, holes, lacunae in the manuscript that do have ink underneath them, right? Uh, what do you mean ink underneath them? Well, sorry, I mean where where it's clear the scribe has not written around the hole, right? There are lots of examples of that. Yeah. So my question is, is the scribe writing through the holes? Because if if it's genuine, the holes yeah. wouldn't have been there at first, right. and right. you would the holes come later so one of the things that i want to see in person is to look with a microscope at those yeah. places to see is the right. ink going around yeah. Yeah. down into that or right. is it stopping at the edge you know is it a genuine break and yeah. there were a couple of places where it, um like the, the papyrus texture is pretty it's pretty 3d really uh, you can see that from the images the ink is seeped down in those, but there is at least one place where the ink, it looks like it's, it, the crack happened later. Um, so I would expect that crack happening later to be everywhere. Um, and it's not everywhere. It's, it's kind of the exception to the rule. Uh, but that's what I would want to see is uh, if it's a fake, somebody took care to make it look like he or she was writing through the holes, but that leaves behind its own trail of evidence. So the other thing that strikes me is that we have a bifolium here. <clears throat> so looks like this wants to be a codex, but the contents are, are a bit weird because they would jump from Acts 8 to 10. What's really weird, though, is the margin on the inside. You have what clearly looks like a fold in the middle of the manuscript, right? Oh, yeah. and you're writing like right up to that. Yeah, and you have um, uh, where the ink was <clears throat> wet, it, it bleeds through across on both sides. Um, so if I zoom in, uh, it's not it's not going to let me zoom in, is it? Um, so right here, you've got an alpha that goes all the way across. Um, this move. Um, we, can't, we can't see your screen. Either. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm not sharing it. That's why. Well, if I'm not sharing it, then I can just pull up real images if you will just give me a minute. Uh, can you see it now? Yep. All right. Yeah. So right here, you've got the alpha that goes all the way across. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, this ADA is showing up over here. That, I mean, the ink was still wet when it was closed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ink is also remarkably dark. Does it seem surprisingly dark to you, or does that seem fine to you? Yes. That may have been the first thing that made me look closer, because it, it is so dark. I mean, it looks at times new. But it, I mean, it gets so thin. So thin, right. It had to have been fairly runny. And it seems to get thin. Can you zoom out again? It seems like it gets thin pretty quickly. Yes, it does. And that, I mean, that could be, again, that could be someone who's not experienced in making ink and just hasn't done a good job. But here's another, like you can see, it comes right up to that crack and it's as if the crack stops the ink. Uh, that makes me uncomfortable, you know? Uh, and that happens again and again. It's these cracks. You can see these happened after the ink. They're, they're gone. Um, but other ones, they don't. It's like the cracks were already there. What's going on with that new? The, that this one? Yeah. That one. Correction, maybe? 
And then, well, what's underneath it? Is that from that bleed through? Uh, I forget what it is. Uh, Al two, maybe, maybe in its oops on. I don't know. How would the if Link did this? How would he have? Would he have purchased papyri? And then yeah, you can get blank papyrus in Egypt. Um, I think you can still get it to this day, maybe not legally, but in his day, it would have been more than easy for him to have acquired it. Uh, he spent time in Egypt. He, he would have cracked it and somehow made it look old. Or it could have, I mean, it could have already been like, I mean, you can get old papyrus that hasn't been written on. There, there are people dig that stuff up. So it, it's possible that he found it already if he made it. Like here, here's a, a strand that's gone kind of weird, but it was kind of weird before it was written. So I don't, you know. I mean, that margin is like, this is not a normal codex with that. No, no. Well, well, I mean, the other, the, side. the other side is even, the, the, the ink is even more in the, into the margin on the other side. Right. Or maybe it's down below that I'm looking at, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, we don't want to uh, keep you guys have any more questions. Um, 